الله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم محمد المصطفى وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وبالخصوص سيدنا عليا وزوجته فاطمة الزهراء عليه السلام Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers, welcome back to this episode in this short series inspired by the period of mourning that we are in for Our Lady Fatima al-Zahra, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon her and her father and her husband and her children. You are joining me once more in which we continue to discuss and in the previous episode we had began by discussing a very important topic and the topic which I wish to continue discussing tonight namely what is the methodology what is the development process that any Muslim scholar has utilized in the past in order to discuss history let us have a very frank discussion tonight brothers and sisters in which we want our hearts to be open to as much academic objectivity as possible and we wish to be as open as possible to what the methodology utilized by the Muslims in order to discern history is. Indeed, there are many out there who have numerous doubts pertaining to this particular event, the event of the martyrdom of Fatima. And it is not surprising, for indeed when you hear one story on the minbar and it contradicts another, this would naturally generate a question within the audience as to whether or not these accounts are truthful. Indeed, there is a sincerity amongst many who wish to know, is it possible? Is it possible that the Ummah turned its back upon its heels in great numbers in the sense that it allowed a small party, a small party of people who had taken the power to oppress Fatima to Zahra and to attack her house and is this something within the realm of possibility? Of course, in the previous episode, I had alluded to the fact that one of the major doubts that we often hear, something which we would often hear from well-meaning, well-educated, people of good standing, people of religious backgrounds, is that they would say, brother, is this rawaya sahih? Brother, is this hadith sahih? And of course, we talked about the fact that this falls into a category fallacy, for indeed what we are looking at are not reports of jurisprudence that we would need to apply the fourfold division of sahih to it. We would not need to look at whether it is sahih, muwathaq, hasan, or va'if. That is not to say that there are no riwayats which meet these criteria according to our scholars. According to our scholars, there are several riwayats alluding to Fatima Zahra's martyrdom. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon her and her, and her father and her husband and her children. And indeed, these reports, according to those ulama, have reached the level of i'tibar and authenticity according to even that fiqhi standard. Let me make that clear. So my discussion tonight is not pertaining to whether or not we do not have such rawayat. I do not wish for us to enter into a false dilemma by thinking that is the topic of discussion tonight. Rather, the topic of discussion tonight is what is the historical methodology utilized by the Muslim ulama? Of course, in previous episodes, I had talked about the methodology utilized by our great autad, our great ulama, particularly some of the great giants of the history of 20th century Shiism, the likes of Kashif al ghata the likes of Muhsin al-Amin, and the likes of Sayyid al khoi Sayyid al-Muhaqqaq, Zaim Hawzat Najaf. When I mentioned their standards, it became very clear that such individuals who do indeed believe in the standard of checking the objectivity and authenticity of rawayat 
in the science of Ilm al-Rajal do not consider this measurement to be the accurate measurement when it comes to ob objectively verifying history. That is to say, they believe that this standard must be diligently observed when it comes to verifying whether or not the Mawla, Allah Azza wa Jal, has commanded a certain action, has forbidden a certain action, or has allowed certain actions to become mustahab or makru. When it comes to particularly the halal and the haram, such ulama have diligently utilized the standards of jarhi wa ta'adil, the standards of ilm al daraya And you can find this laid out in Sayyid al khuis magnus opus, Mu'jam Rijal al-Hadith. But tonight we are looking at a separate topic, namely, what is the standard they utilize in history? We saw that this is not the standard, so allow us to ask the question, is this merely something which is obstructed, confined, and relegated to the Shi'i, Ifn Ashari, Imamiyya scholars? Or have the very scholars have hadith who belong to the movement which calls itself the Ahl al Hadith also engaged? in the practice of discerning between two different types of reports, namely historical and those hadith which classify as teaching us things from the ma'alim al-deen, such as aqidah and halal and haram. Of course, it is necessary to point out that we, the Shia Imamiyya, do not merely accept khabar al-wahid sahih in aqidah. We believe that aqidah must come from those amur which are qat'i, those things which are clear cut and there is no dispute in them. So without further ado, I would like to continue by looking at what some of these ulama have stated. We find that Ibn Hajr al-Asqilani, the famous compiler and writer of the famous commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, someone who is considered by the vast majority of Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah to be Amir al-Mu'mineen in Hadith. He states the following when looking at the biography of Sayf ibn Amr al-Tamimi. He states, Sayf ibn Amr al-Tamimi, Sahib Kitab al ridda Sayf, the son of Amr, from the tribe of Tamim, the author of the book al ridda or the compiler of the book al ridda which refers to the apostasy in the beginning of Islam, what is referred to as Harub al ridda وَيُقَالْ لَهُ الْذُبِّ This is another alternative name which is attributed to him. وَيُقَالْ غَيْرِ ذَلِكَ الْكُوفِ It's also stated that he's from Kufa. ضعيف الحديث He is weak in hadith. Namely, his hadith are not taken. Umda fi tarikh yet he is a dependent upon pillar in history. Afhash ibn Habban al qawl fihi min al thamina wa mata fi zaman al rashid. Namely, ibn Habban has probably the harshest critiques against him, and he died in the eighth generation, and he is from the time of Harun al Rashid. So Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, Amir al-Mu'mineen al-Hadith, according to the vast majority of Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, he clearly distinguishes in all clarity that the conditions of accepting narrations, namely halal and haram, and points out that they differ when it comes to history. Otherwise, it would make no point and it would not make sense to say that someone is umda in tarikh and that they are weak in hadith. It would not make sense to take both of those statements if one were to accept his narrations in their entirety. The second case we wish to look at is Shams ad din of Vahbi, namely the famous student of Ibn Taymiyyah al-Harrani. 
Of course, Shams al-Din al-Zahabi, despite his tutelage under the renowned Ibn Taymiyyah, is someone who is accepted by the vast majority of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You will find even the most renowned of the Asha'ira who have leanings towards Tasawwuf and therefore revile and find problematic the school of Ibn Taymiyyah have taken the statements of Shams al-Din al-Zahabi and have depended upon him. He is without doubt considered a pillar in the science of Rajal. He states in the profile of Muhammad ibn Ishaq, Sahib al-Sirat wal-Maghazi, he states, قال, وَالَّذِي تُقَرُّرْ عَلَيْهِ الْأَمَلْ إِنَّ إِبْنَ إِسْحَاقْ عَلَيْهِ الْمَرْجَأْ فِي الْمَغَازِ And in regards to that which has been decided in practice, verily Ibn Ishaq, he is considered a marja. He is a dependent upon source when it comes to issues of maghazi. Of course, maghazi comes from the word ghazwa which refers to the skirmishes of the Prophet, but the word in general is utilized to even encompass most basic details of the seerah as well. So any detail pertaining to the Prophet's life. Wal ayyam al And the issues of the days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Ma innuhu yashadh bil asha. And yet he would come forward with unique sayings in certain things. وَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بِحُجَّ فِي الْحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ نَعَمْ وَلَا بِالْوَحِي بَلْ يَسْتَشْهِدْ بِهِ Namely, he is not dependent upon in halal and haram. And yet this is not something which is unique. He points out that people have depended upon him. Al-Zahabi is very clear here that the Rawat have depended upon Ibn Ishaq in Sir wal Maghazi and in issues of history, but they do not depend upon him or consider his declaration to be reliable in matters of halal and haram. So those are two major scholars accepted by the vast majority, if not all, of the Sunni world. Now of course, when we say all of the Sunni world, we do not mean unique exceptions to the rule. We do not mean people who are modernists and therefore do not accept those who the classical scholars have accepted. Nor do we mean neo mutazilites We mean those who have depended upon what we call the ulum and naqliya the transmitted sciences. Are those the only two cases we have? No. We come to Ibn Kathir al Dimishqi, Sahib al Tafsir al Ma'aruf, Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Of course, he is also attributed to have been under the tutelage of Ibn Taymiyyah. And Allahu Alam, because this is not my field, I'm not an expert in Sunnism. And nor am I particularly concerned with whether or not this claim is true. If it's not true, then we may throw that claim to the side. Nonetheless, the expertise of Ibn Kathir is not something which is disputed in the issue of tafsir, and more importantly, in the issue of history. For his book, Al-Bidai wa Nahaya, is considered to be one of the most authentic sources. It is one which is widely translated into the English language and one which is heavily dependent upon in the average Sunni home. Now, of course, when I mention these things, I want to make very clear that whether or not these Sunnis and these Sunni scholars, these scholars of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, had made this their standard in history would be irrelevant to this discussion. For indeed, the shubha, the doubt, the unanswered objection of many of our brothers who wonder, is this rawaya sahih? is one which emanates from the lips of the Shia themselves. And therefore, the discussion pertaining to what is the measurement of history is generally one which should have been confined to the scholars of the Imamiyah. 
and we brought forward some of the claims of the most objective, most thorough, and most diligent Shia scholars of the 20th century. And yet, I wish to continue why. In order to establish that this is not merely an inter-imami practice, this is not merely of the saluk of the ulama, but rather this is a principle amongst the uqala. This is a principle amongst ashab al-fan, the particular science and art of historiography. This particular principle is one which they all adopted. Ibn Kathir al Dimishqi, he states when looking at Muhammad bin Amr al Waqidi and what he has to say about him. He states, Wal Waqidi indhu ziyadat hasana wa tariqh. Muharrar Ghaliban Fainhu Minaimmat Havishan Al Kobar Wahua Saduk fi Nafsahi Mukathar Kama Basatna Al Kaul fi Ada Letihi Wajarhihi fi Kitabana Al Mausum bit Takmil fi Marafat al Thukat wa Vuafa wal Majahil Wallah Walilla al Hamd wal Men. Of course, he has to say here that Waqadi has many ziyadat, which are good. He has many extra things, which are good. And his history is on point. And he is from the imams of this field and from the kubar. And he is dependable in and of himself. Now, of course, al-waqadi, for those of you who are unaware, is considered to be a questionable reporter when it comes to that which is halal and haram. And so when it comes to looking at these particular aspects, we see that particularly, given that they are looking at the halal and the haram, given that these are biographical dictionaries pertaining to rawat of hadith, there would be no need to categorically point out that these individuals were reliable in history if there was not a distinguishment, a tabayan, between history and hadith. Of course, these quotes should have sufficed, but it is also necessary to just continue in order that one would see these are not shath or isolated positions, but rather these are positions which belong to the very pillars of the field of hadith when it comes to looking at history and distinguishing between historians in addition to muhaddithun. We find it is reported from Ahmed bin Hanbal in the famous Al-Naqat Al-Muqaddimat Ibn Salah of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Su'ila Ahmed bin Hanbal wa huwa ala baab al nazar Hashim bin Qasim faqila lahu Ya Aba Abdullah. It was asked of Ahmed bin Hanbal, and so it was asked, O oh, Aba Abdullah, which is of course the kunya of Ahmed bin Hanbal. Ma taqul fi Musa bin Ubaida wa Muhammad ibn Ishaq. What do you say about Musa bin Ubaida and Muhammad ibn Ishaq? Faqal, Amma Musa bin Ubaida, falam yukun bihi bas. In regards to Musa ibn Ubaida, فَلَمْ يُكُنْ بِهِ بَاسِ There's nothing wrong with him. وَلَكِنْ حَدَّثَ بِأَحَدِيثْ مَنَاكِيرْ عَنْ أَبْدَاللَّهِ بِنْ دِنَارِ However, he would report deniable reports. Well, there is a debate as to what manakir means in the language of Ahmed bin Hanbal. But since we are not interested in the Sunni science of hadith today, and this is an issue that can be discussed amongst your own scholars. We'll leave that and we'll just focus on manakir, meaning deniable, rejected. Hadifa bi ahadith manakir and Abdullah bin Dinar. Wamma Muhammad ibn Ishaq. For Rajul taktub anhu havihil ahadith. Ya'ani al-maghazi wa nahuha. 
فأما إذا جاء الحلال والحرام أردنا قوما حكذا وقبض أصابع يديه الأربعة So when it comes to his reports of Sirah al-Maghazi, we accept it. But when it comes to halal and haram, we reject it. And he talks about a gesture that the muhaddithun used to do with their hands. When it comes to other reporters and earlier scholars, we find that Yahya ibn Ma'in, or Yahya ibn Ma'in, and of course, his position in Jarhi wa Ta'adil is not something which is unknown to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Sa'altuhu an al Baka'i, a'ni ziyada. Faqal la ba's bihi fil maghazi, amma fi ghayrihi fala. So, Yahya ibn Ma'in is asked about a reporter called al Baka'i, Ziyad al Baka'i. And he responds when it comes to maghazi, namely history the seer of a prophet, then take what he has to say. But when it comes to anything else, then no. As for other particular reports, which are interesting in this field, we find that these are particularly classical scholars who are accepted as being pillars in their field. Some would argue that, of course, when it comes to contemporary scholars, they differ slightly. But we shall see that the case is that these classical pillars and the contemporary experts in their field remain fairly consistent in what they have to say. We find, for example, continuing with the classical scholars, Ibn Abdul Barr, and he is, of course, the author of numerous famous works, one of them being particularly in Tarajm of Sahaba, he states, وَهُوَ كِتَابٌ مَشْهُورٌ عِنْدَ أَحْلِ السِّيرِ مَعْرُوفٌ مَا فِيهِ عِنْدَ أَحْلِ الْعِلْمِ مَعْرُوفٌ تَسْتَغْنِي بِشُهْرَتَهَا أَنَا الْإِسْنَادِ He's describing a book, and he states that the book is famous amongst the people of knowledge. It's so famous that it is above being required to ask for asanid لِأَنَّهُ أَشْبَحْ التواتر فِي مَجِيء التلقي للناس له بالقبول والمعرفة Namely, that we don't need to ask for the isnad because this book is very famous and the people have accepted it and it is well known. When we look at this particular principle, we see that it is shared not only by these individuals, but more importantly, that even the most skeptical and the most diligent of scholars, people accepted as pillars in the field of even areas such as refuting the Shia and in areas of Aqeedah, such as Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyya have also utilized such principles in their works. But of course, I do not wish to de dedicate our entire time to those individuals because I believe that when it comes to establishing the classical scholars, we have cited enough people. Rather, I wish to go to the work of a contemporary scholar, nonetheless considered an expert in this field and when we understand who this individual is, we'll just see how widespread this particular methodology is. Al Doctor Akram Dhiya Al Amri, or Amri, I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation to be fair. This is an individual who has taught at one of the major Salafi universities in Saudi Arabia. And when it comes to this field of history, he is not unknown to the ulama of the Salafiyya. He states the following. In his book, Dirasat Tarikhiya, he states, Amma ishtirat al-sihha al-hadithiyya fi qabool al-akhbar al-tarikhiyya 
التي لا تمس العقيدة والشرعية ففيه تأسف كثير والخطر الناجم أنه كبير But namely, when it comes to depending upon only Sahih reports in regards to accepting reports of history that do not pertain to aqidah nor shari'ah, namely areas of aqaid or fiqh, then this is something in which we allow a lot and a lot of leniency in. لأن الروايات التاريخية التي دونها أسلافنا المؤرخون لم تعامل معاملة الأحاديث Because the reports of history upon which our predecessors, namely the Salafi historians, the Salafi collectors of Akbar, used to depend upon, they did not deal with these reports with the معاملة of hadith, namely halal and haram. بل تم التصاهل فيها وإذا رفضنا منهاجهم فإن الحلقات الفارغة في تاريخنا ستمثل هوة سحيقة بيننا وبين ما فينا مما يولد الحيرة والضياء والتمزق والانقطاع namely if we were to depend upon solely the standards of hadith utilized by the muhaddithun and were to depend upon this in the, history, in the area of history, we would find that our archives of history would be empty and this would leave us with massive gaps and essentially a vacuum and we would be broken off from the past. This is found in his book, Dirasa at tarikhiya on page 27. So when we find this, we find that this particular issue is one that there is agreement upon. It is not befitting for us, therefore, to ask ourselves, do these things meet the criteria of authenticity in hadith? If someone wants to demand that particular standard, then know that they might be claiming to utilize a new methodology. It might be a methodology which they find befitting for themselves, and that's absolutely fine. But yet, it would not be the methodology of either the great historians of the Shia nor the great historians who belong to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So we must know and we must be aware that every field has its specialist. And the specialists of the field of Islamic history have ruled and declared that the need to have a particular criteria which only allows for Sahih reports is one which is problematic. Nonetheless, before we proceed to move on to the next episode, for indeed I'm sure that my time has been cut particularly short, even though I have forgot to observe the time for now, I would like to quote from a particular report of Ahmed bin Hanbal in order that we might understand why these reports have not reached us today. Of course, I, dis I dislike that we enter into polemics at this time of the year in which we discuss something so sensitive and in which we discuss something which is much greater than a bunch of online keyboard warriors debating. Something much greater than our petty need to fuel the ego and feel that we have won some kind of argument, an argument that at the end of the day, your ego will not fill you on the Day of Judgment. And your ego will not avail you on the Day of Judgment. Rather, let us observe this quote in order that this might serve as a miftah, a key, which allows us to understand why some of these reports would be quite isolated and the preponderance of evidence would, of course, be one which is, dare I say, censored and dare I say limited in its outreach. I begin by quoting Abdullah bin Ahmed bin Hanbal reported to us. He said, I asked my father about a man that vilifies anyone from the companions of the Prophet So he said, 
I do not believe he is upon Islam. What is interesting about this particular report is that, and of course this report is found in Kitab al-Sunnah of the famous Hanbali scholar Al-Khallal. It shows to us that Ahmed bin Hanbal would doubt upon the Islam of anyone who vilifies the companions. Now, of course, the term vilifying the companions is a very loose term. There are some who do not speak of the companions in a particularly rude way, but merely narrate what has reached them in their reports and merely question why this has happened. And of course, if we were to go even further, then we would see that the definition of companion does not encompass one who is excluded by leaving a religion, nor does it encompass the hypocrites, according to the ulama of Islam. So if a person is genuinely convinced that a personality who is disagreed upon, let's say for the sake of argument, the disagreement would be upon Abu Talib, who our friends from the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah do not consider to be a Muslim. Are we now to attack them for vilifying Abu Talib by stating that we believe he died upon disbelief? Or is it that the books that have reached them have portrayed to them this particular issue? Furthermore, Yusuf bin Musa reported to us that Abu Abdullah, namely Ahmed bin Hanbal, was asked and Ali bin Samad reported to us, he asked Ahmed bin Hanbal about a Rafadi neighbor we had. He would greet me with salam, do I return it? He said no. Now, what's interesting here is this issue that you could be classed as a Rafadi for b accepting certain reports, which we've seen in history. There are certain reporters who, due to narrating things, have been known as Rafadi on Khabith. And more importantly, we find in, again, Lisan and Mizan, the following. Musa bin Harun, and it is said, Shai, which could be a mistake for Shia, consumed by the fire. The majority of his hadith that I heard from him exceeded proper limits, i.e. they are manakir. He narrates vile narrations defying the companions. In another place, he said he was trustworthy and he would tell about the defects of the wives and companions of the prophets. Of course, what I'm trying to highlight here is there could very well be a precedent of when things have reached the hadith compilers of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Due to a set of dogma, they would reject such reports because they have a preconceived notion that such things are impossible for the wives and the companions. But in doing so, they sometimes recognize individuals who they admit are by their standards reliable, but then are baffled as to why they narrate such rejectable reports. And if those are a few that were known to be reliable, what about all those individuals in history who were once known to be reliable, but all of a sudden became dismissed as unreliable purely due to the presence of such narrations in their books and in their narrations? Brothers and sisters in Islam, it is necessary that we try to show as much objectivity to this discussion. We do not wish to be like those who resort to insults, resort to fueling the flames of sectarian hatred, of sectarian violence. And so I would like to ask for all of you who are commemorating the martyrdom of Fatima. Be civilized in your behavior. Do not be of those who incite others aimlessly. Do not be of those who, in order to prove a cheap point, if you are one of those who cannot back up what you have to say with reliable information, if you're not one of those who could have an academic discussion pertaining to this, do not be of those who try to incite the other. Rather, look into this issue with all objectivity and see what conclusions you come to yourself.
أقول قولي هذا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته